All right, let me show you what's been done in the last 24 hours to the game. So um, previously I showed you these animations where, you know, he moves around. Last time we made this little blob enemy here. And um, basically today I got a, a, a new tick going. I'll show you the tick uh, code that I wrote, but also you can move off the screen and it puts him on about the same position. So what I'm really doing here is just proving that the a scene can transition and the game doesn't crash, first of all, and that it's not leaking a lot of memory and whatever. Um, but I'm probably going to move to a system where the entire world is put into memory at once, and then as you know, you transition from one um, screen to the other. Instead of it being a separate scene, it's actually all the same scene, and the camera just moves. Uh, that way, we'll be able to do a lot smoother movement rather than having to um, recreate the player um, in a different spot and whatever, you know. And for example, this this little thing goes on like right now, randomly places a blob. So if I go left and right, left and right, it places the blob in its different position every time. So having one unified world created at the outset, randomly created at the outset, um, is going to be pretty cool. So let me show you what's changed in the code. Um, let's go there. Okay. So this there's this new tick, which is super duper handy because um, before the tick code used to be inside the area, which is like a, a, an object representing the current scene. Um, but now the tick is in its own little, its own class. It's all, it's totally encapsulated. You know, it can never be instantiated so that, um, there's just this update. All you gotta do is so basically an area, all an area has to do is call tick schedule update with a pointer to its own, um, self and the tick object handles the rest. It's not actually an object. It's actually just, um, uh, you know, some code. Well, I'll show you how it implements itself privately. But, uh, and then there's also this schedule after update because today I ran into a bug when transitioning between scenes and scenes, um, there was a bug where the current entities, if, uh, basically, let me show you what was going on here. So when, um, when, so the move system, when it's running over a move component, it checks to see if a player has gone out of bounds and that's how it transitions to a new scene. So because it creates a new area transition right here, um, this creates a new area scene and then the new area scene creates some new entities. Um, and what that was doing was it was um, because, because we were already iterating over the current components of move components and there were components being added to that same map um, there's a bug cause. So that took some time today basically to figure that out, but, um, that works now. So basically what, what the solution was to that was, um, in the tick, there is, um, basically, let me show you from the area's perspective, the area, um, when it is constructed right here, it creates its own background layer, but then any entities it creates, it puts into a Lambda function. So here, right here, I'm creating a Lambda function, which is Freaking sweet! If you if you haven't seen C plus plus elevens lambda functions, you gotta figure those out. Actually, um, let me show you the uh, let me show you the article that I read that I really liked. Yeah, it's this one right here, uh, cprogramming.com's lambda function. This goes into some pretty good details on how they are. How you know they're super simple to create. Look how look how simple that is. All you do, that's one line right there, that creates a lambda function, and this calls that lambda function. Um, and then lambda functions create enclosures, so it saves the copy of this this variable right here, and um, that's how that I can pass in this function into this tick schedule after update, and then tick can just go and create these objects after the update is already run. So, pretty slick way to, to um, make sure that entities um, are created and destroyed at the right time. So inside the tick, um, this is um, basically a privately implemented tick system. So I don't have to use any variables here. I just use, um, declare them all statically right here. Um, some programmers would frown on this, but I think it's freaking awesome because uh, you don't have to 
put all your variables here into private. You know, you can just put them all here statically in the CPP file. And um, that means you don't have to recompile every time you add a variable. And this is entirely ca encapsulated into this one file. There's nothing that um, is anywhere else. So what the, the tick does is it, um, the schedule update function um, creates a tick scheduler and then adds it to the passed in um, parent. So um, the tick scheduler basically just is a node. So it's a, C, uh, a Cocoa Studio X node, which um, when the transition starts, it schedules itself an update. And um, if you're using Cocoa Studio X, schedule update is what you really want to use because it's way faster than using the schedule update with a certain time. So this runs a schedule update as fast as it can, um, and which creates a much smoother playback for your game. Um, and then also when the exit transition starts, it unschedules the up update. So, um, <clears throat> and then this update function, here's what it does. It just ticks the update, which is a private function here into this C++ file. And then it also runs the, um, runs the current um, after update Lambda function. So it loops over all its Lambda functions and then clears those. So every update, it ticks the update, ticks um, in a fixed time step and then runs any Lambda functions it needs to, to create any entities. So that's basically all there is to encapsulating a, um, a fixed time step inside its own file. So that's it, so that's what we did to create, or that's what I did to create um, this whole system here where that um, moves from one scene to the other and is efficient with its memory and all that. So the next thing I'm gonna do here is to create collision detection. So right now, if I run over the top of this, um, this blob, I can just walk right over it. So the next thing I'm gonna do is create um, a collision detection component. So there'll be a tiny rectangle that uh, represents where the player has its collision detection and then another tiny rectangle where the blob has its. Um, and I'm gonna start with rectangles at first, but then I'm gonna move to ovals um, uh, later on. I'll probably add that tomorrow. So it's really simple to add rectangular collision detection. So uh, I'm just gonna add rectangular collision components right now live and then I'm going to um, the co components, what it's going to do is turn the sprite red whenever there's a collision. And after I've got the sprite turning red, and um, I'll probably add some debug data to show where the collision boxes are as well. After that, I'll make it so the player gets knocked back. Um, if it touches a blob, it'll go bam, and then he'll get knocked back and lose some health. And, um, and then, you know, tomorrow I'll go and basically draw some sword swinging animations for the player. So he can swing his sword, and then if the sword swings at a blob and he's right and they're close enough, then the blob loses health. So, the beginnings of some combat. So let's dive into this with the collision detection, show you how to create a simple collision detection system based on rectangles and ovals. So let's create a collision component class structure. Excuse me. Um, if you've ever read about um, creating entity component systems, a struct is a super cool way to go with um, the components because what you want the components to be is entirely data. You don't want them to have um, any methods to operate on their data because you want all of that to happen in your systems. So back here to the collision component. So we're gonna give it a size. Um, well, actually this is gonna be an integer. So everything um, everything about this engine I'm writing is all entirely integer based so that it's super um, able to be a real-time multiplayer game at some point. So um, if you ever made a real-time multiplayer game before, um, which I've done with my game Hero Bash, um, it's super important to use integers because uh, floating points are not created equal on different platforms. Um, and even on the same platform, like uh, one can be 0 0.999999 sometimes and not compare equally to 1.0. So 
that is really weird. So using integers is rock solid. So um, for this, um, I'm actually going to use an integer vector two to represent the size of this these collision components. So um, in vec two rect, and then I'll also have a int. No, I'll do that later. Um, yeah, just the rect for now. Oh, and also a um, filter mask. Well, no. Yeah. Filter mask and filter category. So we're going to do it a lot like uh, any other collision section you would. So actually category is kind of the main thing we want in here. Filter mask. Filter category, filter mask, and a rectangle to represent it. So passing in a, actually we'll do a size, con size. And then um, int. Okay, there we go, collision component started. Let's fill in these details here in this. So just copying in variables. Okay, so we're just saving it into the component. All it is is data. So, um, oh, let's do this. Now, so we're going to pass into this integer vector rect, rect dot x. This is, x is going to be the width, y is going to be the height. Um, that's going to be uh, rect. Oh, actually. So we're going to use one of its um, operator equals on my integer vector to just store it. Um, basically, let me show you actually how the integer vector works really quick. The integer vector is pretty cool. It, um, um, it basically uses a multiplier and a divisor. So um, even though the integer is like, or for example, um, in Coco Studio if a unit was 100 pixels over from the left of the screen, that would be 100, right? But the integer vector divides that, no, multiplies that by a thousand. So a hundred thousand would be the integer's value. But that would be, you know, whenever you want to get it out into a um, a Coco Sudi X vector, it multiplies it um, by the divisor to get it back into, or yeah, it basically divides by the multiplier or multiplies by the divisor. Either way, you want to look at it to um, convert the value. So basically everything is a thousandth or a thousand times. So that's how the integer vector works and acts a lot like a float would, but retains its rock solid integerness. So um, rectangle vec2 rect dot, rect dot width rect dot height. There we go. Okay, now we've got the size of this collision component stored inside the, uh, the integer vector. So let's go to our area and let's start with just the hero and give him a collision component. No, autocomplete. All right, anyways. Um, no, that's size. So size. Uh, Let's start with just 20 wide by 10 high. See how that looks. 
And then we're going to need some filter categories and masks. So go up to my constants here. Um, Filter, um, filter neutral, filter friend, filter foe. Easy enough, right? Oh, what's great about using um, C11 also is you can declare enum types. Those are awesome. And we don't need anything for the mask, so. So we're gonna actually have to go over to the component here and change. No, we're, I'm not gonna actually uh, make this a one of those strongly typed enums. They're really kind of annoying when you have to, when you start doing integer math with them, but they are great when you want to make sure it's an exact enum type or you need an exact value. So now we've got that category. Um, his filter category is going to be K filter friend. And his filter mask is going to be um, Mm, so how am I going to do this? Right? Well, this is what it would be. It would be, you know, the maximum value XOR. So basically I want them to collide with foes. Actually, I want them to collide with all. So, for now, let's make the component have a default value on its filter mask. All right. Actually, let's do. constant for that. Alright, does it still compile? No, why not? Non static memory variable. Yeah, um, I've seen this before. Just make it static. Right, because that would have been It doesn't make much sense until you think about it, but making a variable static const just works. Something weird like that. Um, there we go. Now it's got a default for its filter mask, and that way we don't have to just always specify that value when we're creating one. So there we go. We can now now the player has a collision component. Now we need to create a complete collision system. Just to make sure we're still running, right? Yeah. Okay. Now let's create a collision system. All right. There we go. Created just a default um Do blank functions, collision component, no, collision system, Pick. there we go. We don't do anything yet, but now we can instantiate one in the tick. 
So over here at the tick, create a private system here. Hmm. I'm wondering if the collision system should be a part of the mood system. Uh, move system. Let's see. Let's just see how this works. Okay, back to the system. Um, I think first I want to do some debug data to show that the where the rectangle is on the screen. I could do this two, one of two ways. I could, um, I could create a pixel uh, sprite and then scale it up to be the size of a rectangle that it should be. Or uh, I kind of like that idea a lot, actually, rather than trying to create a, yeah, let's do it that way. OK, so render components are now going to have a debug sprite. defaults to default to null down here create one just a pixel which is a lot like this where I draw the debug anchor point Oh, I didn't even need to create a, oh, maybe I do. Yeah, okay, we'll see about that. Uh, okay, collision. Color for this collision box is going to be, yeah, I usually do red, but I want it to be transparent. So we'll set it down to like 64 or something, nice and light. Set the position, yeah, right where the anchor point is, exactly. Um, and then add it and put it behind everything. Cool. Now, what, um, let's do one simple thing in the collision system. Every time it ticks, we're gonna loop over some stuff. We're gonna go and make sure that the collision um, the collision debug pixel sprite is the right um, right size, right scale. Closing component, render component, that's what we need. All right, if, if we're drawing debug data, go into the collision component, or the render component, um, yeah, collision, and set its scale. Okay, should be, if that's a pixel, then the scale X should be the same thing as the collision components. Um, Uh, 
Oh, you know what? This closing this component is not named very accurately. This rect really should be a size. It's not a doesn't have a okay. That's a little more clear now. Nomenclature. Importante. Size. 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 Okay. Call. Size. Dot. Uh, yeah, get back to that. To y. Okay, so this doesn't do anything yet except for show where the collision rectangle is. That's all I really wanted though at first. First step. Step one. This. Let's see if it works. Okay. He does have a collision uh, point there, but it's not the right scale. So something's wrong with that. Um, and the the other guy didn't have a collision component, so it shouldn't have. Oh, we should just go um, component or render component. Render component should not make these by default visible. Collision set. Set visible, false, and then it's the render system that sets it to be. So if the collision debug sprite is not visible, make it visible and make it the right size. So let's figure out here also, let's log out the size, figure out why that scale isn't working. Um, collision box scale. Um, let's just do that. And this. Bam. Now we can look at our console log and figure out why. It's not right. Okay, they're both not visible. That's a curiosity. Let's see if we even got that. Yeah, I don't think we even got that. Okay, why? Okay, what's going on here? I set it to not visible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Hmm. Set visible false. Transition. Okay, I'm not gonna set visible to false just yet. There it is. So I'm visible to false again. So I'm visible to true here. Hmm. Oh, I know exactly what's wrong now. We haven't gone and hooked up the collision system yet. So back in our tick, we created the collision system, but we didn't actually hook it up. So move system tick. Okay, do we want this? Well, let's collision system.
Copy and animate. Bring it down. Take a percent. Okay. I'm not sure whether I want the move system to go first or the collision system to go first, but well, let's think about that. Move and then collide. Yeah, I guess move and collide. That's that's the right way to go. All right. Yeah, it worked. Okay. Good, 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 good. Okay. Now that I think about it, the collision system should probably... Yeah, it should run after. So what the collision system will eventually do, like there'll be some things that are static fixtures, like I'll have maybe a pillar here on the over where this player is now, or, um, you know, just, there's gonna be tons of stuff on the screen eventually, and things that won't move. And what I think will the collision system will do is, if the player has moved into a fixtures um, position, the collision system will move it back. And then later on it'll render, so it'll look like it won't have ever moved on top of that uh, solid fixture. So, next we want um, to give, let's give um, the blob its own collision component as well. And it's going to not be as big. So let's do 10 by five and K filter foe. We'll make this guy an enemy. Beautiful. Yeah, I think this, I think it's just right for, oh. One thing I probably wanna do is make the collision box um, anchor point just right here. So let's fix that. Do a lot like this. Well, yeah, just do it like that. Collision. Set anchor point zero for five zero. So that'll put its anchor point down at the bottom. So it should just align with the bottom point. Now, yes, exactly what I'm talking about. So now it's right at his feet. Same thing with the blob. So let's make his collision box a little smaller. We're talking maybe let's try 15 at first. Maybe five? Let's see. Yeah, about like that. Cool. All right, we've got boxes set up. This is a good first step. Now let's make it so when there's a, a collision is detected, the player bounces off and loses some health. So the collision system is gonna handle all this. Collision system is also gonna need a health component so they can knock down its health. All right, uh, so how are we gonna detect this? Well, we're gonna loop through all the other collision components and see if there's a collision. Man, well, that, what that's gonna do is, okay, I don't know exact, because if I loop through all the other collision components, while I'm already looking through all the collision components, then um, there's going to be two collisions every time. So what I'm going to start with, I'm just going to keep it really simple and make it so um, 
only testing if the player collides. Or maybe just if friends collide. Yeah, that's a, or, yeah. So if call filter category equals K filter friend. For now, it's not the right way to do it eventually, but just for something simple for now. Um, we're going to go loop through all, we've already got all the collision components, so what, we might as well, I think we can do that. Yeah, let's try that. Now. We're going to need a collision component and a move component. This is this should be best put into its own function so that I can just not do this kind of janky variable naming here. But anyways, this is the collision component. Here's its move component to get its position. So let's test if these collide. Uh, I think we'll create recs and then test if the recs collide. So recs um, rect r1. Oh, we don't need to do this every time. We need Call my rect. Um, first is going to be the uh, position of the rect, or the, the basically the bottom left corner. So that's going to be. Uh, now I need to move component. This guy too. Dang, it's a lot of components for this system. But oh well. Okay, so we're gonna go move components position. Um, minus half of the collision components size. The Y position is going to be the same thing as the move positions Y minus the collision sizes Y. And then the, oh, this is really easy, this one is just um, going to be the size of this rect is going to be the collisions size. So there we go. There. Now we've created a rectangle which represents the friend. So now let's create another rectangle for the foe or the other entity. Now this is going to be this entity's pause, this entity's collision, same thing here. An astute programmer would notice that here's an opportunity to create a nice little function, right? So I'll probably do that at some point. Okay, not my rect. This is gonna be your rect. Okay, we got my rect and your rect. Oh, and this is wrong. This needs to be P. Based on there we go. Good. This is it. All right, now we've got my rect and your rect. Let's see if they overlap. So if my rect dot intersects rect, your rect.
collision is occurring. So what I want to do is go and change Let's go like this. At the beginning of all this, we're going to set the render sprites color to white, which is uh, essentially no tint. So white is, is neutral. And then we're going to go, um, if there's a collision, we're going to turn the sprite red. Cross your fingers and hope it works. Oh, okay, we already have a problem. Oh, you know what? It's probably colliding with itself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right? We'd have to make sure that the filter mask and all that. So, I mean, okay. If C equals null pointer or M equals null pointer, continue. And then if the coll your collision, mm, no, if my mask, no, if your collision uh, uh, filter, yeah, if your filter category and my filter mask, is that right? Let me think about that for a second. Okay, so your filter category is O. Oh, my filter mask is O. Oh. I just realized that we should never have the default filter mask. So back to creating, here we go. So this should be Collision component. Okay, filter all. XOR. So basically, I want the um, the hero to collide with everything but itself. Or you know what? I'm gonna have to do this a different way. Okay, so actually, because I want it to collide with other friends. So let's do, um, now that we've done this, let's make sure that this bow also has just a filter all. Um, and then in the system, we need to come up with a different way to detect if you're colliding with yourself. So how do I know if I'm colliding with myself only? Oh, duh. Let's check the entity ID. So what we're also gonna need to do this filtering as well, but if um, if your ID equals my ID, continue. That's what we need. We don't even need to check this stuff yet. If your ID p dot first equals my ID There we go. That should keep it from colliding with itself. So I shouldn't be red anymore. Cross your fingers. Yay. All right. Does this work? No. Huh? Huh? No. Why not? Oh, yeah. Wait, it did work. It's probably just to the wrong. Doing some math wrong here at some point. Uh, hmm. Oh. Okay, so the problem is that, okay, why is it? Huh, I'm gonna make my guy move the hero move a lot slower so we can see just debug this little situation. Here's its speed. 300 per second. Let's set that down to 100 per 
second. Whoa, mega slow, but... Okay, wait, why is it all working good now? Okay, it's not. Because, okay, so it's, it's like the center point on the X plane is colliding, and then... It's like it's using a really, really small rectangle. Like, we're talking really small. Okay, what's up with that? Let's use way bigger collision components at first. So instead of 15, we're gonna go 105, or no, let's go 150, 50. And then you are gonna be 100, 50. Make it obvious. Whoa, really obvious, right? Okay, it's not that the filter, it's not that the masks are, or the collision components are too small. It's that. I think it is. I think they're just half as small as they need to be. Oh, maybe visually. Yeah, maybe they're just visually twice too big. That's probably it. So if I go to the render component. Man, that's like tough to know, right? Okay, so if I go to the render component and create its, or the collision system, and just make its load scale half. That makes sense, right? Half the scale, because Right? Oh, cool. I think it's right. How do I know if it's right? Well, I don't know. You know what? I just noticed I'm kind of over time for this video. Um, but there you have it. Um, the collision detection system has been started. So tomorrow what I'm gonna do is, first I'm gonna verify that this these squares are correct. Then I'm gonna go um, and make it so when the player um, walks into the blob, it bounces off and loses some health. And then I'm gonna make it so we can swing a sword and hurt the, the blob, so. There y'all have it. That's about it for today's video. Um, if you gotta wanna go and watch any past videos, you can always go to my YouTube channel with the link is in the info for the Twitch. So that's it. Talk to you guys later.